just a hack. It's just an absolute hack. And he gets his ass kicked by his teammates every week. It's just, you know, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Welcome back here, everybody, on Hack City. I'm Joe DeLeon, joined as always by my former teammate, former roommate from the University of Rhode Island, Sean Anderson. Today we're going to be recapping and talking about the finalists for all of the national awards, as well as our thoughts on the analyst, stats, FCS, All-American team, some of the guys that stand out to us. All that more coming up on today's episode. Before we get to that, though, Sean, can you just share with our listeners really quickly a word from our friends over at Bet Online? Why? I mean, I would love to. Uh, we are getting into a nice little pocket of football season here, a fun pocket where we're going to have a lot of games happening really quickly. A lot of bowl games going down, uh, a lot of NFL going down. And then eventually, because commercials keep on telling us about it, football season is going to be over soon, which is a bummer. And then you're going to have to bet on baseball and then you're going to have to bet on basketball. Not as much fun. Get your football betting in while you can head to bet online. Use the promo code believe that's B L E A V for your 50% uh, match on your first deposit bet online where the game starts. So Sean, I'm going to start us off here with talking about the finalists for the Walter Payton award, uh, which is the Heisman trophy of FCS football. The, um, best player in all of the FCS level and who was the most important players for their teams and just some of the best guys on some of the best teams in the country. Um, the three that ended up being the finalists that we ended up voting on here, we end up having Max Brosmer of New Hampshire, who I believe is now transferring to Minnesota. We have Mark Kronowski of South Dakota State. And then lastly, Jaden Sheridan of Monmouth, who makes the list for a second time. I got to just really quickly say, uh, a little surprised that there's no Isaiah Davis, but the uh, group of fellow voters that also voted on this with us uh, ended up going with Gronowski. I thought that Gronowski was fantastic this year, but uh, I'm surprised that Davis made it in over Sheridan. Understandably, Sheridan had another great year, but still feels really weird that we don't have Isaiah Davis in this conversation. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, I voted uh, for uh, Sheridan uh, for sure. I've been a huge proponent of him. Glad to see that he's on the ballot competing against two quarterbacks that had very, very good years is tough. It's going to be tough, especially for a player on Monmouth. Not super hating on Monmouth, but it's not nearly as much exposure as Brosmer got at UNH quarterback, and they had a big time offense. And then uh, South Dakota State, obviously in the championship, the quarterback of that championship team, going to get a lot of notice. Uh, but I thought Sheridan had a phenomenal year. And I feel like uh, the back-to-back great years like this, I think he was definitely deserving of it. New Hampshire's Max Brosburn ended up leading the country in passing yardage with uh, 3,464 yards. He ends up also having 29 passing touchdowns. So I understand Brosmer's placement and where uh, he was in the location. Again, I, I'm not knocking Gronowski. I think Gronowski deserved to be in the discussion. Ended up being probably one of the better dual threat quarterbacks on the best team in FCS football. And as we know, these are quarterback driven awards where these guys that are on the best teams are going to be in the discussion. Yeah. Um, they're going to make their way to the podium. Uh, Sheridan ends up finishing the season uh, with 1,400 yards, which is a lot less than he had the previous year, which is, again, a little surprised to me how he ends up making him his way into the mix. I think, though, that my pick ends up having to go with Gornowski based on the three finalists on who I think uh, will deservedly end up winning this award. He wasn't my first pick, but I think that Gornowski – on the best team and has made it this far and has played the best in the most important games makes the most sense. I can see how it makes sense. Uh, Granowski, Granowski would probably be my third out of the three. I think Brosmer at two because he did a lot with his legs as well this season and Sheridan's my number one. I don't know why. I got a lot of faith in the guy. I love the way that he runs. He's got great energy on the field and I think he's going to be an impact player at the next level. If it's NFL, XFL, CFL, Wherever he ends up, he's going to make an impact. Uh, so with that, I, I thought it was a pretty easy uh, number one vote for me. And then after the three is where it really started getting complicated. I think I had Isaiah mm. Davis in the top three as well. I so I, I was a bit shocked that he was left off. I mean, he's just such a good player. I, I think that you do have to include him. The Buck Buchanan for the nation's best defensive player finishes with their three finalists as a 
finalists of Terrell Allen of Tennessee State, Dylan Kelly of Albany's amazing defense, and then Billy Schaefer from Lafayette. I, I like that there's a strong mix of players and none of these guys are particularly on any of the national championship teams. And I like that we have an Albany guy representing one of the best defenses in the country. And I talked so highly of Lafayette's defense and the fact that we do end up with Schaefer in the mix, I think is super deserving. All three of these guys ended up having uh, phenomenal years, particularly Allen who ends up finishing the year with 14 and a half sacks, 28 tackles for loss, which is just a ridiculous number. Kelly, on the other hand, he this season, eight tackles for loss, uh, three sacks, two interceptions, two forced fumbles, one fumble recovery, and two quarterback hurries. Lastly, Schaefer, who, again, just a ridiculous season, 75 tackles, uh, 49 solo tackles, 20 and a half tackles for losses, a linebacker, 10 sacks, four forced fumbles, seven quarterback hurries, and five pass breakups. Yeah, it was definitely, I, I think, a big boost seeing the Lafayette defense get a little bit rewarded. Uh, that is good. They had a good enough team this season and finding their best player on defense and saying, you know what, you guys uh, uh, did some shocking things is what I will call it. Uh, at times, Lafayette did shock me. Uh, so if you're able to pull that off and have the ability to have a suffocating defense and then be able to get ranked at points in the season as Lafayette, it's impressive and there's a reason for it. Uh, so the nominations, uh, it, it's it's weird. Don't have I really do not have much issues with the nominations, and maybe it's because a lot of these guys, uh, are, you know, are stepping up now that we have a bunch of transfer portal movers. Who's going to be the guy to step up? We're starting to see it a little bit. Albany had a bunch of dudes step up all across. So this time around, a lot of fresh faces for me to analyze. The guy I'm in, I ended up going with who led my voting was Terrell Allen from Tennessee State. I, we're just talking about an insanely ridiculous stat line. 14 and a half sacks is a great number, but holy crap, 28 tackles for loss is it's just ridiculous. a ridicu ridiculous total for him to put up for Tennessee State. I, I don't think he's necessarily got the physical profile like an Isaiah Land had to at least get an NFL look because he's on the smaller side. Um, but regardless, this is just, I, I don't know how you don't pick the kid. I think that the other two options here, Schaefer and Kelly are good players, but Allen has to get this with the number that he put up. Yeah. The, the 20 TFLs is, is it's laughable because who has that? And that's not just beating a guard a couple times in a game. That's beating guards every time in every game. That's beating tackles every time in every game. And, and, and it's just, Really, really impressive seeing that big number. Uh, got a cast, a vote cast from me as well for Allen. The Jerry Rice Award for the newcomer of the year, the freshman of the year in FCS football, was awarded to Eli Gilman of Montana. He was my pick. I thought yeah. this was a no brainer. Uh, the top five ended up finishing as follows Eli Gilman, number one, MJ Flowers, number two from Eastern Illinois. Jawarn Howell from South Carolina State, running back, number three, number four, Ty Nightcamp, linebacker from Illinois State, and then number five, Griffin Woodell, running back from Albany. A lot of running backs. I think it's one of those positions that typically uh, it's a lot easier to contribute and get into the mix early. But for the rushing totals that Gilman put up, it was so much better than any of the next closest guys had. But I think the biggest aspect of this year is the way that he played in important games. At Sacramento State, he rushes for 113 yards. Northern Colorado, he has 106. Not necessarily a difficult opponent, but still a really good rushing total. And then we see, we've see we seen his impact in the playoffs thus far. Maybe not as big as it was during the regular season, but when they've called upon him and they've given him touches, he has stepped up to the plate and made some pretty big plays. I'd say so. His 5.6 yards per carry is massive for Montana. He was a guy that they could rely on all season when they needed him, when they needed to move the sticks. And at times this year, they struggled with that. And then when they started catching fire, he started as well. Uh, you could see that the dynamic between him and McDowell got better as the season went uh, moving forward. Just became a huge piece for them to right the ship and then get back uh, to the national championship.
it, without him, I don't think they make it. They, they, mm. if you do not have that impact running back, I don't think they make it. it he, he's different than just your regular college running back. He is an impact maker. He's a guy that's going to make somebody miss or run them over. Such a valuable asset for the Grizz team. Eddie Robinson Award for the Coach of the Year is awarded to Jimmy Rogers of South Dakota State. He beats out Greg Gattuso from Albany and then Bobby Houck from Montana. Look, I know a lot of people were pounding the table for Houck, and I think that he deserves to be in the obviously in the conversation and him landing at three. I think I voted him as number two from my ballot, but one, Albany's head coach, amazing turnaround. They were pretty weak post COVID. They were pretty, pretty weak for them to end up going all the way to the quarter quarterfinal. I know that they got smoked, but still it is an achievement to get at their team where they did, but we can't not award this to a guy as a first year head coach. I know that he's operating with another team's roster mm-hmm. or another coach's roster. He's still been on the coaching staff and the results are phenomenal. Man, they, they have been dominating and blowing past a, a lot of teams on their schedule. I know a lot of people love to point out, oh, they stumbled against Villanova and they played uh, Southern Illinois close. They're they're not this unbeatable force. But for how good they've been and how dominant they've been, they deserve the recognition of one being the best team by a large amount of separation and Jimmy Rogers getting that award because of the way that – it'd be one thing if he took over the team and they were just – really good but they've been elite they have been in that elite category of one of the best uh fcs teams that we've ever seen yeah uh i've got some uh, it's tough when you're going for coach of the year because how do you factor it of of undefeated first year jimmy rogers puts on a clinic this season and and you're like wow you got to vote this guy how could you not but then you look at uh you look at Albany's turnaround, and then I, I think I voted uh, I had a, a vote cast pretty high for Bob Nielsen from South Dakota, what he did this year, and I think they maxed out on their potential, and that's tough to to swallow, and that's not saying they can't have better potential next year, but I really thought Nielsen got the most out of that Coyotes team, uh, and then I mean Hawk in Montana, you kind of you have to respect what he did down the stretch. They got hot at the right time, and they didn't flame out. They continued to grow, and they continued to win. So that was uh, impressive. I, I, I was I was okay with Rodgers winning. It, it, I think that typically I give coaching votes and coaching awards to coaches who have turned around a mediocre to bad team to prominence where you really feel the impact, whereas with South Dakota State, all credit to Jimmy Rodgers, but – the players on that team were were just head and shoulders above. They were veterans. They had been there before. They were comfortable all year. And if he made them comfortable, cool. Uh, but uh, Rodgers was not my number one vote. I can respect why he was and why he did win, uh, but he was not my number one. Did you wait? So you went with Hauk? Uh, I think I went with Nielsen for South Dakota. Oh, interesting choice. I, I, I... Yeah. hey, look, look, I'm. <laughs> I'm not saying he's a better coach, but coach of this year, I thought he did a fantastic job. To quickly round us out here, the All-American teams that were released by um, Stats, the analyst, Stats Perform, the analyst. uh, Quick shout out to Craig for including long snappers in the mix. Uh, I think that that was uh, something that we don't get a lot of with these lists, which is is always a positive. Just a quick couple of thoughts on on some of the guys that that kind of get on here that I think were certainly really deserving of the recognition that they received. One of the ones that I liked the most was the inclusion of Jalex Hunt, where he was placed uh, on the second team. I'm a really big fan of him as a draft prospect. Very, very twitchy player that I think is going to be um, highly impactful as an edge rusher. I, I like that we see a lot of these talented offensive linemen that were a part of the South Dakota State team, particularly Garrett Greenfield and Mason McCormick. And then we all are not going to be shocked by the representation by Albany and the fact that Junk Cage ends up being on here. I believe uh, we also ended up having Kelly in here in the mix as well. So uh, good representation from a lot of the top teams in the FCS. I would say so. Uh, I do not have many uh, quibbles with the first team. Second team, I look at quarterback Cam Miller and quarterback Matthew Saluka, and I say, okay, 
you know, I am not totally upset by second team uh, for the quarterbacks, but then I look at the third team and you see you, I have Poff and Barger and Davius Richard, and I'm like, ah, they both had better years than the second team quarterbacks. So yeah, I don't disagree kind with of, that. Kind of looking at that, like, and then, and, and I, I feel bad for the quarterbacks because that's just where the narrow focus always goes. Uh, but I mean, that is, I believe that those two, I believe that Miller, Miller and Saluka should definitely 100% be swapped with Poff and Barger and, 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 and Richard. They, they both had fantastic seasons. Saluka underperformed and Miller underperformed. If I'm being, if I'm going to be blunt about it, that that's how I read it. I don't like that representation. And now that I start talking about it, I'm starting to feel a little bit more. Don't like it officially. Officially don't like it. Take it up with Craig. Uh, folks, thanks for tuning in. Obviously, we love all the work that Craig does and uh, appreciate the inclusion on letting He's us the best. vote on these awards. At Joe Delio and at Sanderson Radio, folks, thank you for tuning in. We will be back after the holidays with a preview of the national championship game. Stay tuned. More coming.